Okay, we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Research Showcase, our monthly gathering to present uh, ongoing projects and research on or about Wikimedia projects. My name is Kinaret Gordon, and I'm the lead communi research community officer at WMF. Um, for those of you that are joining us live, uh, we welcome you to ask questions today uh, during the during the presentation using our YouTube chat. We will monitor this channel and pass the questions to the speakers. Uh, and before we get started, we kindly ask all the attendees to follow the friendly space policy and the universal code of conduct. We have a couple of announcements before we move on to the showcase itself. Regarding Wiki Workshop, last week we announced the call for a new track called Wiki Workshop Hall. And this is a novel space for researchers and Wikimedia movement members to connect with each other. We hope that through this new track, we'll create a dedicated space for learning, exchange of ideas, the spark of curiosity, and community building. Uh, we would like to mention that we welcome proposals from both researchers and non-researchers, and we hope that these proposals align with the interactive and collaborative spirit of the Wiki Workshop Hall. We look forward to having a variety of content, content experiences and learnings, knowledge pieces, how-tos, open questions, pain points, and more. During the hall, we'll have a breakout room uh, for each of the accepted proposal um, proposals, and attendees can move freely between the rooms to interact with their hosts. In addition to Wiki Workshop Hall, we will have the research track, the original track of Wiki Workshop, in which researchers will be able to present a published and ongoing research project and work on Wikimedia projects. While the research track will consist of a series of presentations and Q&A, the Wiki Workshop Hall session is intended to be more dynamic with interactive formats suggested by the proposal of authors themselves. We invite you to submit, submit submissions for both the Wiki Workshop Hall and the research track. The research track submissions are open until April 22nd and submissions for Wiki Workshop Hall are open until April 29th. All information about both of these track and Wiki Workshop Hall in general can be found at wikiworkshop.org. So we invite you to visit there and stay, uh, and stay updated on all the latest news. Uh, another quick announcement is that last week we opened the nominations for WMF Research Award of the Year. The award, the award is meant to recognize research that has the potential to have significant impact on Wikimedia projects um, or research in this space. Nominations are open until April 18th. Um, so we invite you to nominate any research um, from the past year that uh, that applies to this. Um, winners will be announced during week, during Wiki Workshop. So that's one more reason to attend uh, the event that is happening on June 20th. That's it for the announcements. I'll now pass it over to my colleague Isaac, who will introduce the theme and speakers for this month. Thanks, Kinaret. Um, hello, all. I'm Isaac Johnson. I'm a senior research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Glad to introduce the March 2024 Research Showcase. Um, so March is Women's History Month. So today we'll be focusing on gender and equity. And within our research team, we, we subdivide all of our work on uh, focused on knowledge apps on the Wikimedia projects into three phases, understanding, measuring, and addressing. For the gender gap in particular, there's a long history of research looking into understanding causes of the gender gap, the ways um, in which it shows up in the projects, and different approaches to accurately measuring gaps in community and content diversity. So for this showcase, we're going to be focusing on this third phase, addressing the gender gap and research that provides insight into different approaches to this challenge. Our first presentation will be from Nicole Schwitter, a postdoctoral researcher at the Mannheim Center for European Social Research and an honorary research fellow at the University of Warwick. She completed her PhD in sociology on the on on the offline relationships between Wikipedians in 2023, which we're about to hear about. Um, and at the moment, she's a member of the Mannheim-based project Making Diversity Work, which aims at using innovative field experimental methods to study ethnic discrimination. Her current research interests comprise computational social science, social networks, and migration and discrimination. And her presentation will be focusing on the topic of edit-a-thons, which has long been a successful strategy for generating interest and content relevant to women. Um, but one challenge for the research perspective, at least, has been quantifying this impact. Anecdotally, we know it's powerful, but with a few notable exceptions, the empirical work has been stymied by the simple fact that it's very difficult to determine what content or contributors are part of a given event. So I'm very excited for this work because it directly confronts this challenge. Our second presentation then will be from Mo Hoody, a computer science PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. 
He does research in human-computer interaction with a focus on mitigating bias in online video conferencing technology and incorporating community values into recommender system design. His presentation focuses on recommender systems. For years, editors have used various tools to help finding tasks uh, to complete on Wiki. These recommender systems shape many edits that happen on the projects, which makes them a tempting target for aligning with equity goals like addressing the gender gap. So Mo will be presenting on some very exciting experiments with the disclosure. I'm an author on this work, um, but I do think they're very exciting that explore this potential with the venerable SuggestBot recommender system. After each talk, we're going to have about 10 minutes for discussion, and we'll be happy to take your questions in the YouTube chat. My colleague Eli will monitor that chat and relay the questions during Q&A. And with that, let's pass it to you, Nicole. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. And welcome to the YouTube crowd as well. I will start sharing now. So as you've heard, my name is Nicole, and um, today I'm going to present part of my PhD research where I focused on offline meetings between Wikipedians. So I did focus on, on Wikipedia, obviously, and as we all know, Wikipedia is an online encyclopedia, and it is people that write this encyclopedia. It is a number of volunteers, me, maybe also you, which contribute to this online encyclopedia and, and create this great resource. Those contributors work online, but they also meet offline. They sometimes put on a nice, they put, hopefully they put on a nice pair of pants. They also put on a nice t-shirt and they go out into the real world to socialize, to get to know, to know each other, to get, you know, the name behind the username and the real face behind the username. So those offline gatherings were the center of my research. And in particular, I was interested in finding out what role these offline meetups play. I played, I, I looked at different kinds of online behavior and I'm going to look into a few, well, one behavior today. But first, to, to address those research questions, I needed to get the data. And as Isaac mentioned, it is quite difficult to collect data on offline meetups. So what I did, I was working with the German language Wikipedia, which is one of the most active and one of the largest language versions. And I was searching for all meetups which happened between its launch in, in, in 2001 and 2020, when well, offline meetups came to a halt due to the COVID pandemic. And the German language Wikipedia does have quite an active offline community. There is this page called the, the Meetups Between Wikipedians, which links to many, many organizational, which to kind of entities, regional entities, where those offline meetups are organized relatively independently. Such an, such an organization, such an organizing of a meetup can then look as follows. So on the left, you've seen a screenshot from the Ryan Hessian organization, the regional entity, and how they are organizing the very first meetup. On the right is the My English Translation. Um, so we have a section or even a page for the first meeting. We have a section on attendees where people sign up if they're, if they're interested and if they can attend. We have a meeting, we have a section of people who would have liked to come, but who couldn't make it. We have a, a list of topics, um, so kind of what was planned for this meeting. And we also have a section about results, which basically summarized um, how the meeting went, went, what they talked about, and um, where they make future plans. So for this meeting, we have four people who signed up, a couple of people who wanted to come, and in the results section, they all said they, they had a great time and they are going to continue this tradition of, of meeting in the Ryan Hessian space. And that's the information that I was interested in in collecting. I wanted to know who is attending, what meeting, with whom, and when. Ideally, I wanted to collect all offline meetings organized within the German language Wikipedia. To achieve that goal, I, I scraped automatically and oftentimes manually a number of different pages. So I started with the overview list of meetings, which is this, this meetup page you saw before where regional entities are linked 
to check for all meetings which are organized. I also checked overview lists of editathons and other open editing events. I checked overview list of events and kind of insured events. And I also checked all wiki projects and task forces for meetups organized within this context. Throughout all of this, I employed a snowballing approach, meaning that whenever I found a link or like uh, another meeting which was organized, I also collected it and I followed out all, all the links which, which looked promising. Of course, this, this doesn't guarantee a, a complete collection, but I did try my best. There was a number of meeting, uh, meetings I, I did have to exclude. Um, in particular, I excluded very regular meetings, which took place in community spaces. So community spaces are um, kind of designated rooms or spaces or institutions, which also often receive funding by the foundation, which kind of are kind of headquarters for volunteers. And those are interesting spaces, but they are also spaces of very high Wikipedia activity with um, weekly meetings or even multiple meetings a week, like regular board games or other work meetings. And while they would be interesting, they also often lack a list of attendees. So people stopped signing up. And as a researcher, I didn't know what was happening anymore. So I did exclude those from my, my research. So what kind of data do I end up with? I collected over 4,400 meetings with over 4,100 attendees attending those meetings. And I do have information on the place or the venue where it took place, the date when a meeting took place, what kind of meetup it was. In particular, I distinguished more social meetups and work meetups, a social meetup being one where people really meet to socialize. In German, it's the very informal Stammtisch, where people meet up to drink a beer and just get to know each other. Um, and what I mean with a work meetup is a meeting which does have the inherent idea to work on Wikipedia, for example, an editing event. I also collected all attendees. If available, then from the minutes which are written after the meeting, if not, then from the list of attendees. I also collected the apologies as well as the minutes written after the meeting. Now, if you look at the, at the plot on the right, we see that the first meetings took place in 2003, so around two years after Wikipedia was launched. If I remember correctly, the first meeting was in Munich with, with five attendees. And after 2003, the number of meetings steadily increased until around 2009. And since then, there are around 300 face-to-face -face meetings in within the German language Wikipedia. Um, the majority of those being more social in nature, but an increasing part also being more of a working meeting. The spatial distribution doesn't really bring any surprises. As I collected the, the German language Wikipedia, 99% of meetings also took place within the German speaking area. So Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and Liechtenstein, um, with most meetings happening in densely populated areas and big cities. So we have um, a higher activity in, in Berlin, Vienna, Munich, and the North Rhine-Westphalia region. So the data I collected, um, which is also published um, by now, um, kind of then looks like this. It is a simple table with a row per meeting and information on, on where it happened and the um, corresponding coordinates, what type of meeting is, it was and whether I consider this more social or work oriented, which entity organized this meeting, so which regional entity or which, which, which wiki project. Um, as well as the, the minutes written, um, the source, and the attendees. So this data is available by now, and a um, data brief is also published in the Journal of Computational Social Sciences. Uh, both data and um, paper are open access. So please, if, if this is something that interests you, please, please continue working with this data set. So now... Um, one question I had was that I wanted to know how those meetings affect contributions to Wikipedia. And so we do have those attendees. And what I wanted to know was whether going to the meeting affects contribution behavior. So I have my meeting attendees, which are in 
experimental speak my, my treatment group. So they, they experience the treatment of going to a meeting. And I do have many, many control users that didn't go to a meeting. And now we do have some, some self-selection of those um, meetup attendees. But I still try to find a comparable user that, sh that didn't go to a meeting and is just very similar to those people actually attending a meeting. So for each of my attendee, I was looking who is their closest twin, basically, who has been um, active on Wikipedia for the same number of days and who has been recently um, kind of has, has made the same number of edits, both um, in their whole kind of time on Wikipedia as well as more recently. So for each of my attendee, I was looking for a digital twin. And with this, I my aim was to identify a causal effect and kind of replicate a quasi-experimental approach. Still keeping in mind that this is not a, a perfect experiment, we don't have randomization and there is some self-selection. I then employed a difference in differences design, meaning that I compared changes before and after the meet meeting of actual attendees and the corresponding control group. So what does this mean? Um, I will now talk about long-term changes of one year. So I'm looking at the one year activity of those attending a meetup and compare it to their activity one year before a meetup. And I will compare this change to their twins that didn't go to a meeting. And I will also compare their um, changes in activity within those across those two years. I will break this process into two, se two separate parts. First, I'm looking at users which have not made an edit in the year before the meetup. And I will then model the decision whether they make an edit in the year after the meetup. And in the second part, I will look at users which have made at least one edit in the year before the meetup and um, look at their change in the number of edits. I'm only focusing on, on number of edits here, not on size, not on quality, simply the, the number of edits. So what do I find? Well, for this, this first decision, so looking at users that have not made an edit in the year before a meetup, um, I'm looking at the decision to then make an edit in the article main space within the German language Wikipedia. And the baseline probability, this is what we see at this intercept, is at 6%. This means if I'm looking at a user that has not attended a meetup and has not made an edit in the last year, there's a 6% baseline probability that they will make an edit in the following year, not having gone to a meetup. The treatment group is then the treatment effect. So that is being in the group that has actually attended a meetup. And here the probability rises to 31%. So we have this treatment group effect added to the intercept. So there's a 31% probability that a user that has not made an edit in the last year and then went to a meeting, um, there's a 31 probability that they will then make an edit in the following year at least one edit. Looking at the extent, again, looking at um, main space edits, um, I find a negative intercept and a positive treatment group effect. So this means that um, a user which has not taken part in a meeting will reduce their activity across time. This is kind of the usual finding of, of people being very active in the beginning, but less active in the future. So taking a user that has made at least one edit in a year, they will make on average um, 12 edits less in the next year, not having gone to a meeting. If they actually went to a meetup, um, I will add again this treatment group effect. And what I fi find is that they make around four edits less in the following year. So overall, to summarize those results, uh, meetups do have a positive effect on Wikipedia. So users attending a meetup are much more likely to start con contributing again, if they haven't done so before, after the meetup. And it is not the case that people are more active necessarily after a meetup than before. But over time, on average, we find that people are less becoming less active and the reduction everyone on average experiences is less 
in people that actually went to meetups. So this is a positive effect. If you want to read more about how meetups um, influence contribution behavior, then um, wait. <laughs> the journal publication is still on, on people's, on someone's desk. Um, but I did present part of this also at the Wiki workshop two years ago. Um, there is a, a extended abstract that you that you can read. Now the topic of today's um, research showcase is addressing gender gaps. And one way that the Wikimedia Foundation is addressing gender gaps is through those editathons and campaigns. And most of those are happening offline. So there are there are the the art and feminism editathons or women in red or Wiki loves women. There are many activities that do happen offline. And I haven't looked at those in my research, but there is some previous research on editathons that I do want to highlight. So we do have um, some research that has especially conducted interviews with participants, for example, by Hood and Little John and colleagues where they try to understand the learning experiences and the role of personal relationships that are being developed at editathons, and they do find that those matter. Um, Better et al. has also conducted interviews with participants of an editathon to study how, how they are learning and how their critical thinking is developing. There's some research which has focused on the organizers of editathons and what their um, motivations are. And there's also one study by Farzan et al., which is kind of closer to what I have done. So they looked at newcomers, which signed up as part of an editathon, and they then compared their activity with newcomers that didn't sign up to Wikipedia as part of an editathon. So they also kind of looked for digital twin twins that didn't go to an event. But now coming back to my research, so what can I say about the, the German language, Wikipedia, and kind of and offline meetings and, and gender gaps? One important question is to ask that is the question, who is attending offline meetups? And well, the images already kind of tell a story. And um, so the main conclusion here is that not everyone is equally likely to attend meetings. And meetups minutes, so those kind of summaries written after the meetup, read, for example, that there's a skewed age distribution. For example, in Bonn and Halle, they were discussing how it, how it would be good to get in touch with more young people. And there's also a skewed gender distribution. So again, in Bonn, Dresden, or Munich, it was discussed that the female quota, unfortunately, was only at around 11% or at times even over 20%, and generally that they are aiming to include more women in those meetings. So to summarize, meetups do have a positive, albeit a rather small effect, small effect on contribution behavior, at least on average. That is what I can show with my research. And we also do know that many campaigns and events try to directly target women as new editors. And I do believe that this seems like a good idea, but there are still challenges for good impact evaluation. So there is no publicly available data on sociodemographics of users. So I cannot give you a number about the percentage of female editors attending meetups. I only know what people write in their minutes and I only can see what we can see from public images. Um, but there's no real um, clear finding of the number of women attending. Um, and another problem is that not all meetings provide well-maintained lists of attendees. So uh, this is especially the case for editathons, where it is very hard to track the, about who is signing up as part of an editathon and to really track their activity over time. So what do we do with all of this? I'm not sure I've provided all the answers that you might have been looking for, but um, from my side, for the community, I would like to, to highlight that offline meetings do have a positive effect and personal relationships are important to contrib contributors. And something, a piece of advice that is, that is never wrong is that positive and inclusive meetings are a good thing and, and should be fostered. And focusing more on research, um, 
I think it's important to keep in mind that better data helps to do better research. Um, so if you're attending a Wiki Wikipedia meetup, I would advise you to sign up in the list of attendees because it might help future research. And I said it before, but I want to say it again, that please feel encouraged to use the Wikipedia the, the meetup data set that I published for further research. So um, if that is something that you're interested in and you would like to focus more on editathons or to look at the quality of edits instead of just the number, or you would like to look at newcomer retention or anything else, then please feel encouraged to, to use the data set. And with that, I'm looking forward to questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, wonderful presentation. I know you're just skimming the surface too on some of the things you can do with this. Um, we're now going to take about 10 minutes uh, to do some questions for the room and questions from YouTube. So if you're on YouTube and watching, um, add your questions to the chat and we'll, we'll bring them to Nicole. Uh, to start us off in the room, I'm going to pass it off to you, Pablo, who I believe has, has a question. Yeah, thank you, Isaac. Uh, thank you, Nicole. For your presentation I, you can hear me right yes yeah okay so well first thanks for for saying this so important work this is this is great work but also it's very important work uh you, you conclude with this idea of better data means better business and i think this is very relevant uh, i do remember <clears throat> some time ago there was like a study about gender gap in spanish wikipedia uh collecting data from from the platform and i remember a response by Evelyn Heidel from Wikimedia so for a while saying like there are many other activities that are important for the community that are not captured by platforms. So it's important to have metrics that are inclusive. Ah, yeah, sorry, I arrived late to the slide. Sorry for that. <laughs> I miss it. So it's super, I, I'm excited that you, you're, you're covering this part. And we as a research team, one of our audiences is uh, the affiliates. So we, we need to support them. So from all the research you are doing, you have give some ideas in the end with a summary, but I don't know if you're wondering if, like to propose how to document these kind of events for a lot of future reasons. I'm thinking like in the same way that machine learning models now there has been like uh, model cards, uh, inputs or data sheet for data set. I'm wondering if you could even propose like some way to document uh, meetings that can create some kind of a standard across the movement and help future research to to identify that. Yeah, thank you so much. And also thank you um, because I know uh, you pointed out this article by, by Evelyn, I think on, on Twitter to me, and it was really interesting and I did want to, to talk about it, but then I kind of ran out of time. So it's in my expense uh, appendix, but I'm happy you, you highlighted it because I do think it's an in interesting article kind of highlighting how um, women also do like sort of invisible housework on Wikipedia and um, that it is not enough to be on the platform and edit. And there are many other tasks on Wikipedia, like organizing things, organizing those, those sort of editathons, organizing training, and also inviting new people to join that are kind of can be understood like other sort of housework and care work. And this is also being often overlooked. So I do recommend uh, to people to, to read this article because it does propose interesting ideas. And yet to your other point, I, I do agree that. So um, I think the biggest hassle in my project was data collection and just working with lots of unstructured and inconsistent archives. So there are some regional entities which really kind of try to have a consistent structure. And it was very easy to write an automatic scraper because they always use the word attendees and then all attendees were list and they used the same kind of words. And that was really nice. And the other other places, um, well, to name and shame, I think Cologne and, and Mainz, um, they just deleted previous minutes from their page. So they, they didn't have an archive. They just kind of deleted the, the latest, they, they deleted all old meetings and just used the page, page to organize new meetings. So you then kind of have to go through the, the version history and look for when the latest meeting was um, deleted from the page. Um, so yeah, if this 
is something that should be explored more, and I do think it should, then um, it would be nice to kind of, well, not enforce, but encourage people um, to have an archive, which is being updated and have this archive in a, in a very consistent form. Um, another problem I, I did have was um, usernames. Um, so something I wanted to do in my research was to link offline activity with online activity and um, people sign up to, to meetings with their username. And um, the username can change. So people can sign up with a new name or they can also request a rename and also working with like data that, that has been written 20 years ago, just kind of um, conventions change. So by now there's a clear convention how people sign up with their username on Wikipedia with kind of the wiggly lines and then the username appears. But 20 years ago, there was more flexibility about how people signed up to things. Um, so I did also have like issues regarding the uh, how exactly people wrote down their name and encoding and capitalization. Um, so part of my research was also creating a name to ID lookup table where I collected all redirection links of a user, all their renames as locked in the renaming lockbook, and also whenever people explicitly mentioned that they changed their username. Um, so this is kind of another hassle, which probably cannot been cannot be overcome. Um, but yeah, it would help a lot if there's like one clear structure, and we then we can kind of encourage people to use this kind of this one form about how people archive their meetings. Thank you again very much. <laughs> I can at least give some positive good news around that and that our campaigns team at the Wikimedia Foundation has been looking into event registration and hopefully pointing towards a future in which there's a little bit more structure around this. Because, um, yeah, I'm so amazed by all the work you did, and I hope very few people have to repeat it. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's a good world in which, yeah, it's a lot easier in the future. Um, I believe Eli has a question that's kind of related to this. So I'm going to pass to you, Eli, to ask your questions. Yeah, thanks, Isaac. Uh, thanks again for the talk, Nicole. Uh, my question is a little bit related, uh, but imagining uh, that I am someone who may be uh, starting to organize more meetup components uh, around editing in my wiki, for example, uh, some other wiki. Uh, having done this work, what recommendations would you uh, like to highlight around maybe what I could learn from from this study and and take that to organizing meetups uh, in, in another wiki or editing community. I think a slightly related question that I'll also throw in if you'd like to address is, um, in one of the earlier slides you showed, there was an interesting, maybe notable decline in social versus work activity and the trend line that we saw. I was wondering if that's meaningful, how to interpret it. And then I think the way this relates to my previous question is, um, it's sort of the question of to what degree does it matter if that uh, meetup is more social or work in nature? Uh, does that have any impact uh, on on subsequent editing? Yeah, thanks for those questions. They are both really good. So um, advice in terms of how to organize a meeting. I think the simplest advice is really just to kind of be inclusive and be nice. So people liked meetings when there was kind of a round of introductions and just everyone felt welcome. Otherwise, otherwise newcomers often dropped out. So um, people attending once, but then never again because they didn't felt inc didn't feel included in like a a group of people that has already met many many times. Um, so from from what I get from all the minutes that I read, which there there were many. Um, it's pretty much common sense. So like be friendly, be inclusive, let people talk with each other. Um, something that also wasn't liked that much was if the minutes that were written were too detailed. So some, um, some people really liked to write down which person 
talked about what very specifically. Um, so whenever you think something might be too private, then maybe don't publish it on Wikipedia because people don't like it. But overall, all of my advice would be very much common sense, be friendly and inclusive. And um, so regarding those those work and social meetups, um, yeah, I also find the the shift a bit interesting that we do that I do do observe more work meetups over time. I think especially in the beginning, um, it was just a, more of a let's get to know each other when Wikipedia was maybe still a bit smaller and well, the internet overall was a bit smaller and friendlier, at least in oh, that's my impression. And people were just excited to get to know it, to get to know the people behind those usernames. And by now it's more um, focused on let's address specific gaps. Um, but this is an interesting point that, that I would encourage anyone to further look into. And the, the effect of work and social meetings. Um, let me jump to my appendix again. There is some stuff in the wiki workshop paper and uh, we do find some different effects um, especially regarding shorter term changes so what i talked about today was long-term changes looking at like the year activity before and after um, in the paper I'll, i also look at um, shorter term activity comparing the week before a meeting with the week after and the month before a meeting with the month after and um here I do find some effects. So looking on, on the plot on the left, um, looking at what is highlighted in yellow. So again, we're looking at article main space activity and we're looking at the binary decision. So we're looking at people who have not made an edit in who have not made an edit in the week before a meeting, and then look at whether they make an edit in the week after the meeting. And um if they went to a work meeting instead of a um, social meeting, then they are like 10% more likely to make an edit in this week after the meeting compared to when they went to a social meeting. So work meetings are a bit more positive, at least in the decision to edit at all in the short term. Looking at the extent, there is no significant effect, so no real difference between work or social meetings. And if we look at long-term changes, again, looking at this year before and this year after, then we also don't see a significant difference between work and social meetings. So it might well be the case that work meetings show gaps and kind of motivate people to work on Wikipedia now and to um, kind of do what they maybe just learned. Um, but in the long term, it is more like that being invested in the, the offline component plays a role. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for covering this. Thanks so much, Nicole. At this point, I think we're going to switch over to Mo's presentation. Um, hopefully have a little bit more time for discussion at the end too. I know you did a lot of work around admins too and how that relates to this data set, which I find absolutely fascinating and is uh, yeah, a big open question too on the wikis. I know as we see a kind of a decline in adminship on certain wikis. Uh, so I think that's a interesting area as well. Um, but Mo, if you're ready, you can share screen and I will pass to you for your presentation. Sure. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Nicole, for a great presentation. Um, and thanks to everyone at the Wikimedia Foundation uh, for inviting me here. Uh, really excited to be talking about this research, research today that I did in collaboration with, uh, obviously, Wikimedia's own Isaac Johnson um, and with my PhD advisor, uh, Lauren Turbine, who's also at University of Minnesota. Um, uh, this is going to be based on a research paper that is not quite yet published, but should be in the next month or so. Uh, in the meantime, there is a copy uh, freely available on Archive that I will link to at the end. As I talk through this, I'm going to gloss over a lot of uh, some of the methodological details so that we have time to talk about some of the, the higher level implications. But if you're interested in those uh, methods, deep dives, uh, feel free to take a look at the paper. All right. So 
Uh, I'll start just at a high level by uh, by covering what I hope uh, everyone kind of takes away from this presentation. Uh, it's just two things. The first is, uh, I think, in general, editors are open to editing more content gap articles, uh, and that creates a, a really important opportunity for us. Um, and this is uh, something that comes out in the research that I'm going to present today, but also some research that we've done uh, in the past a uh, couple of years ago that I'll touch on briefly. Um, and then the second is that recommender systems can be part of the solution to content gaps on Wikipedia. And these two things are uh, very strongly related in uh, ways that'll become clear as I move through things. Um, so at this point, you might be asking yourself, Mo, what the heck are recommender systems? Um, or maybe you're somewhat familiar with them, but you're not totally sure. Um, very straightforward definition. They're literally just systems that recommend things. Um, and an example of this is, uh, this is from my actual Amazon homepage, uh, where Amazon recommends things for me to purchase based on things I'm pur I've purchased in the past. Uh, and the, the idea behind this is that they're personalized recommendations because you have this giant space of items that you really need to narrow down to a smaller subset that's actually useful for the user. Uh, and in this case, uh, actually presenting personalized recommendations uh, helps Amazon sell me more stuff, uh, and it works a lot better than I would like it to. Um, now, recommender systems are a very core part of the modern internet landscape. Um, they're really everywhere. If you're watching this on YouTube uh, and you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll probably see a set of recommended videos. Um, another common place you see recommender systems is on Netflix. Uh, news recommenders are, are very popular. Um, but they're really everywhere because they're a really powerful tool for giving uh, people content that's most relevant to them in a space uh, or in a, in a world where there's so much content available. Uh, and one place, obviously, where there's a bunch of content available is on Wikipedia. Uh, this is a bit of an old screenshot from uh, English Wikipedia's homepage. Uh, from back when there were only 6.4 million articles. I think there's something like 6.8 or 6.9 nowadays. Um, but this is kind of a classic example of we have a giant space of articles uh, that anyone can edit. Um, and uh, a very important way that we can help editors is by helping them answer this question that is going to logically pop up. What should I edit? And so sure enough, there are recommender systems on Wikipedia that help editors answer this question for themselves. Uh, newcomer tasks, for example, um, which I think in 2023, uh, there were like 600,000 uh, edits done through newcomer tasks. Um, but essentially the way it works is you select the areas or the topics that you're interested in, the difficulty and types of edits you wanna do, and it suggests articles for you to edit. Um, there's Wikipedia articles for translation, uh, which recommends articles for the, the editor to translate from one language to another. Um, there are others like SuggestBot, which is going to be the focus of a lot of this presentation. Um, this is a personalized recommender system based on uh, the editor's uh, edit history. So it looks at what you've edited in the past um, and then finds uh, similar articles to recommend that are um, tagged with uh, needing certain kinds of work. Um, so again, I, I want to emphasize that that personalization aspect of recommender systems is really what makes them powerful. It's not enough to just put items in front of people. You have to put the right items in front of people. Um, and so in SuggestBot's case, in the original paper that presented and evaluated SuggestBot, um, Cosley and, and colleagues uh, found that uh, SuggestBot increased the number of editing uh, by roughly four times compared to just suggesting random articles. Um, so so the, the, the idea that this was intelligent task routing was, was pretty important. Okay, so let's go back to that question of uh, what should I edit? Um, there's uh, kind of a, a straightforward way to answer this question, which is uh, as a Wikipedia editor, I should edit what I want to edit. Um, but but embedded in that are uh, a lot more questions and and uh, the landscape of, of kind of Wikipedians values around editing is actually quite complex and pretty deep. Um, and so we'll just focus on one kind of sub answer to that question, which is content gaps. Um, as Nicole uh, uh, mentioned, there are uh, a bunch of campaigns that organize uh, Wikipedians and, and that's a, an important kind of work that's done on Wikipedia aside from editing. Uh, one of those campaigns is uh, Wikipedia or Wiki Project Women in Red, uh, which uh, organizes editors around filling the gender gap. Um, and so 
one kind of answer in this case to that question of what should I edit is, hey, we should really be editing articles that will help us fill the gender gap. And it turns out that this isn't just something that Wikipedians talk about in uh, content gap uh, centered spaces. Uh, we also did uh, an analysis on vital articles, which is kind of a more general project where Wikipedians uh, tried to uh, come up with uh, the 50,000 most important articles for English Wikipedia to have at a high quality. And what we found is that in large part, the way people uh, decided how high priority an article was, uh, was partially a function of how it affected the composition of quality content on the platform. So uh, the, the kind of simple way of, of saying this is just people thought articles uh, or said articles were more important for Wikipedia to have at high quality if they, uh, if having them at high quality would fill some sort of content gap. And again, this is not in a project that, that is explicitly organized around content gaps. And so this motivated our research question here, which is, you know, with this understanding that when they, when deciding what they should edit, Wikipedians often consider content gaps and recommender systems are one ways or one tool that we can give Wikipedians to help them decide what they should edit. What if recommender systems also considered content gaps instead of just optimizing for editors' perceived interests based on what they've edited in the past? And so there were two kind of plausible possibilities that we saw that could happen here. The first is, hey, you're considering content gaps. That's making this recommendation uh, or this recommender less personalized. Um, and, you know, if people wanted to edit more content gap articles, then the recommender system algorithm would reflect that and they would get more content gap articles and you're going to end up making people edit less. And then there's another possibility, which is more optimistic, uh, which is that, hey, actually, there's something that recommender systems aren't currently capturing and considering content gaps is one piece of that. And we can make recommendations more useful for people by better serving editors' values. So both of those were very plausible. Um, we uh, had to figure out which one would be borne out empirically. Uh, so we did an experiment on SuggestBot. This is what a standard set of SuggestBot recommendations looks like. Um, and uh, we ran this over uh, three months uh, where we essentially replaced uh, a subset of the recommendations that uh, users got uh, with uh, explicitly content gap recommendations to see what the difference in editing activity would be uh, would be between what they would usually get and and what they would get if if we uh, uh, prioritized content gap articles. Um, to walk you through how we ran this experiment, uh, I think it's useful to go through at a high level how SuggestBot works and how it generates these recommendations. Um, so the first thing it does when uh, an editor asks for a set of recommendations is it generates this really long list of candidate recommendations and it sorts them from most relevant to least relevant. Where most relevant is just the, the item that SuggestBot is most confident that editor will want to edit. Um, so it's the most relevant item to that editor. Um, now, obviously, uh, we don't want to give editors a thousand recommendations, so uh, SuggestBot applies a filtering process. And this filtering process is mostly pretty straightforward. Uh, some of the criteria here are, uh, we wanna make sure that we don't recommend something that's already been edited or already been recommended. And, and what we're trying to avoid here or what SuggestBot's trying to avoid is obviously that issue of, uh, you know, if you buy a toilet seat, we don't wanna be recommending you toilet seats for the next three years. Um, and so it goes through the list and when it finds an item, it adds it to your list of recommendations and it starts over until it finds another item, adds it to the list of recommendations. And it basically repeats that 30 times um, until you have your full set of recommendations. And then it posts those to the uh, requesting editor's uh, talk page or, or wherever else they, they want the, the recommendations posted. Okay, so the way our experiment worked is basically about half the time we added one criterion that corresponded to one of uh, several content gaps. Um, so uh, in 55% of cases, one of these additional criteria was added. Uh, one of them is, is this article a biography of a woman? If it's not, keep going until you find one. Does this article pertain to the global South? Is it about an important topic? And we, we operationalized important topics as anything uh, relating to the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. 
Um, so things like education, human rights, uh, agriculture, um, any articles that fell under those categories were, were considered important topics. Um, and so this resulted in four groups of recommendations. There's that baseline set that are unchanged. And then we have three treatment groups, uh, which each correspond to one content gap. Now, the problem here is that we know that since we've added a criterion for each of these treatment groups, we're going to need to reach further down that list to find those treatment group recommendations. And since that list is sorted from most relevant item to least relevant item, we know that on average, the items in those treatment groups are going to be less relevant. And so if we see a difference in editing, we won't actually know if it's because they're content gap articles or just because they're less relevant. We want to be able to disentangle those things. So what we did is we also included some non-content gap articles that are also about the same amount further down the list. The way we accomplished this was fairly straightforward. Um, some of the time when you are looking for uh, or when to, to find a control group article, you find the first uh, uh, first valid treatment group article, and instead of recommending that one, you recommend the next non-content gap article. So the result was that we had a group of, uh, you know, we had our baseline recommendations, our treatment recommendations, and then a set of non-content gap recommendations that were at about the same uh, place down the initial list of, of candidate recommendations and about the same amount of relevance. Um, we ran this experiment for three months, as I mentioned, um, during which we got, I think, 38 to 40,000 recommendations in the data set. Um, this is what it looked like to uh, editors. So we didn't point out which ones were replaced. Uh, what we did do is we, of course, included a message uh, letting people know that they were participating in a study, giving them an easy way to opt out um, and a consent information sheet with more info. Um, and this is what we found. Um, basically, editing differences were really tiny and not statistically significant. Um, but what we also found is that uh, treatment group articles were edited a tiny bit more than control group articles, but less than baseline. And so all other things being equal, uh, editors seem to have a slight preference for content gap articles. But in general, the differences were not uh, large enough that, that we could really measure them with any level of confidence. Um, what the effect of this was, uh, was, you know, these are actually really encouraging results because what the effect of this was is that by just putting more content gap articles in front of editors, there was so little difference in the editing or like reactions to those recommendations that we ended up over the course of our experiment increasing uh, the uh, proportion of editing uh, that was on those content gap articles. So this is uh, the percent, the percentage of edited biography recommendations that were about women uh, in blue is during our study period. And uh, to the left in red, you can see uh, in during the same months in 2020 and 2021, uh, that proportion was about uh, 30% and that went up to 40.5% by just putting more of those articles in front of editors uh, and, and basically asking them, hey, uh, this is something that you might want to edit. Would you like to edit it? Um, so the takeaway here is Recommenders can be part of a solution. Um, obviously, not the whole solution, um, but we've uh, we've touched on a, a couple other pieces of the solution, uh, editathons, for example. Um, but recommenders can certainly be part of a solution, and they can also be used to support um, some of those campaigns and editathons. And, and maybe that's something we'll get into later. Um, but there's still this question of like, why did this work? Why were we able to basically make this algorithm essentially less personalized, give people less relevant items, and yet still kind of see very, very similar editing activity. Um, and I have a theory um, that editors are open to editing more content gap articles, but they're just less likely to find them. Um, and this fits with some of the other stuff we know in the literature. Um, so if we think about this conceptually, uh, we have you know the circle that represents all articles. Within that, maybe we have a circle that represents all of the articles that an editor has discovered, has seen, has, has thought to edit. Um, and then within that, there's a smaller circle, which is uh, all of the articles that that editor has edited. And we look at that circle. 
and basically use that to figure out what's relevant to someone with the idea that what's relevant is going to look something like that. It's a bigger circle um, that's that's kind of centered around what they edited. But what's actually relevant is maybe a little farther away from that. It's it's also a larger circle, but but is is uh, systematically pushed in a in another direction. Um, and the reason this is important is that self focus bias. The fact that we pay attention, you know, as humans, we pay attention to things that are more relevant to us uh, is going to constrain that discovery circle. Um, and so to think of uh, an analogy for this, or to bring up an analogy for this from some of our previous work, um, this is from a discussion on vital articles where an editor uh, expressed surprise that the article on something as important and, and central to like so many people in the world as menstruation wasn't already a vital article. And then said, but as one of the 90% of male, art male editors, I wouldn't have even thought to add it. And so there may be a similar phenomenon going on, on here where editors aren't necessarily thinking to edit content gap articles, but if we put content gap articles in front of them, you know, they're, they're perfectly happy to edit them. And, and that creates a, a big opportunity for us to, to leverage these tools to help uh, editors find more of those articles. Um, so I'll conclude again with those uh, two takeaways uh, and elaborate on them a little bit. Um, so again, in general, editors are open to editing more content gap articles, but may just be less likely to find them. So recommender systems can be part of the solution to content gaps on Wikipedia by helping editors discover interesting uh, articles they might not otherwise edit. Um, I'll stop there and take questions. Uh, as promised, there's a QR code to the archive copy of the paper. Um, if you have, uh, you don't have a chance to ask your question here um, or want to reach out after you've read the paper, feel free to email me there. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Mo. Um, at that point, I'm going to check if there are any questions in the room or on YouTube uh, for Mo at this time. In that case, I can I can start us off. Um, so I know you know we talked about obviously for the for the showcase with the focus on Women's History Month we're talking about gender, um, and I think in many ways gender was uh, to me is one of the more like optimistic ones around recommender systems. And I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about some of the geography results and the um, kind of climate change sustainability related topic, the important topics uh, side of things too. Um, yeah. So. Another piece of this paper that I didn't touch on was that we actually ran two studies and this experiment was the second part of it. Um, in the first part, we uh, did some kind of offline analysis uh, to, to make sure in part that we weren't just likely to just completely wreck the, the recommendations that people were getting um, to see you know, what kinds of recommendations are people who use suggest by editing currently. And what we found is that uh, you know, we looked at, I think, a year's worth of data and, and uh, figured out, um, you know, how likely was an editor to uh, edit any given uh, Global North versus Global South article. Um, and we found basically no difference on geography, uh, no significant difference uh, between important topics and non-important topics articles. But we did find a significant positive difference in favor of biographies about women. Um, so yeah, to your point, the, the picture on gender is uh, more positive. And that could be for any number of reasons. The, 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 the first one that comes to mind is um, you know, that the process of editing, uh, you know, a woman's biography versus a man's biography is a lot more similar than, um, you know, editing uh, something that's related to a topic that you're very familiar with and that's a, a, a part of your life if, if say, you're, you're interested in, in editing uh, articles about cities, for example. Uh, a lot easier to edit uh, about stuff that's close to you and that you know about than stuff that's uh, farther away from you and in a different part of the world. Um, so yeah, those are just some some high level thoughts. Um, uh, to uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question, Isaac. Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. Um, 
What's I know there's a question from YouTube that's for you, Mo, and also we have Morton in the room. Um, so I think this will be a good one for maybe both of you. Um, Eli, do would you like to ask that question from YouTube? Uh, yeah, thanks, Isaac. So there's a general question coming in, Mo. That is, um, this is from YouTube. Are there any next steps planned for the bot? Um, next steps for the bot in particular, I'll, uh, I'll defer to Morton on as for like general, um, next steps that I think make sense based on what we found here. Um, I think, as I mentioned, there are a lot of big opportunities to, um, use recommender systems as a way to support campaigns that are already doing a lot of work on content gaps. Um, and I think there are a couple advantages to them. One of them that, that immediately comes to mind is that um, content gaps are actually really difficult to um, quantify, I guess, in a really straightforward way. So like the gender gap, one aspect of it is, um, you know, uh, the, the difference in, in male versus female biographies. Um, but there are kind of more difficult things to quantify. So the 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 one that I mentioned, for example, uh, the, the article on menstruation, it, it's hard to know, like, you know, exactly how you would quantify how many articles related or, or important to uh, women uh, exist uh, compared to uh, articles that are uh, of relevance to, to men. Um, and, and I think uh, campaigns give us a uh, a very good way of uh quantifying that and and so we can rely on uh on on some of the data they generate uh for example lists of of articles that uh that they think are important uh to inform uh what uh, recommendations are, uh, or we can incorporate that in some way in recommender systems to help uh, amplify uh, their effects. Um, on the suggest bot question, um, I'll, uh, as I said, defer to Morton, who uh, is uh, maintains suggest bot. Yeah, I'm going to unmute and um, chat about this. So. Hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Morton. I'm a data scientist in the product analytics team at the Comedia Foundation during my daytime. And then as a, on the volunteer side, I run SuggestBot uh, and have been doing so uh, for since 2010 and collaborated with Mo and Isaac on this research project. Um, <clears throat> I uh, We don't have any specific plans on, on incorporating this work into SuggestBot at the moment. Um, but I was I was super excited from from seeing these results, and I think they they really point to um, point to the the opportunities that exist in just being able to put content suggestions in front of people and have them make decisions about what they want to edit and discovering things that you maybe didn't think that you would edit is is always a useful part of it, and there. Um, there are so many different types of work to do in Wikipedia as well, um, which is another thing that I thought about is that like finding, so like SuggestBot, for instance, one thing that sometimes comes up is that it has a list of stubs, um, but some of those stubs aren't actually stubs. It's just that no one ever thought about removing the stub template from the article. And so there's this kind of like maintenance work in Wikipedia as well. Some of it, yes, yes, you know, we want people to also edit articles and expand them and add more content and improve their quality and so on. And that's awesome too. But some of the work is is finding an article that has someone else has expanded, copy edit it, remove that stub template, and that's you know valid work as well. And so um, I wanted to mention that, uh, but also. I think this is super exciting results. And so kind of like my question to Mo is how difficult is it to build and maintain a data set of these type of, of um, uh, kind of content gap articles in order to be able to put them into a set of recommendations? You know, is this something that you had to spend a lot of time on kind of like building for the specific research project or is this kind of like readily automatable in such a way that you can you can more easily 
uh, folded into the uh, the recommendations? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, thankfully, I had a lot uh, easier of a job to do than Nicole did. Um, a lot of this data is, um, I wouldn't say like easy to come by, but not uh, difficult either. So for gender data, for example, uh, Wikidata is a great resource um, for uh, linking uh, biographies to uh, genders. Um, uh, Wikidata also has information on geography, like linking uh, general articles on topics to the regions uh, that they're relevant to, um, whether they're explicitly geographic articles or even articles about people or, or uh, particular concepts that are relevant to a particular region. Um, and so Wikidata uh, gives us a lot of structured data for labeling uh, articles along um, some of those kind of simpler dimensions. And then uh, there's also, I think, a good amount of structured data uh, on what uh, various wiki projects have uh, labeled uh, as articles that that are that fall under the the, the scope of that wiki project, and that uh, is useful and, and easily it's it's easily accessible and it's useful for for linking articles to um kind of broader uh, topic areas or domains thank you mo um let's do caroline i think we'll do your question um and then i'll pass it to keener to, to close this out I'm seeing Caroline's question in chat. Q for Mo. Um, I was curious if any demographic data were collected from the folks who participated in the experiment. Uh, if the answer is, I think the answer is no, but I was wondering if women editors who make up a small portion of editors are more likely to edit gender gap related articles recommended to them. And maybe that's why the effect was small. That's a great question. Uh, that's <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we don't have demographic data, but we did control for editor in our um, in our uh, uh, methods. Um, I'd have to think about if yeah, we didn't we didn't control for editor gender, um, and and so that that may be why the effect was small. Um, and again, that's just the difficulty of like getting accurate uh, demographic data on on editors. Um, so yeah, that's that's a that's a very good uh, hypo. That's a very plausible hypothesis. I will say, and I'm sure there's work that looks at this on Wikipedia. Um, I might not just might not be aware of it. I know there was some work a few years ago that looked at it on OpenStreetMap and didn't find um, there. You have to come up with some proxies for like what does it mean to you know there isn't male cities and female cities, for instance. Um, but there, their findings were kind of like the patterns and the types of things that um, male contributors versus uh, female contributors in OpenStreetMap weren't that different um, in terms of the types of tags they were adding and, and things like that. Um, I want to say thank you to both of our um, both of our presenters. If there's a takeaway I'm getting from both of these, it's the value in having nice structured data um, as far as uh, making research possible into some of these spaces and then um, to mow to your presentation to then be able to build tools around it too to help kind of address these gaps. And I think that's a really important theme I see across both of these papers um, and what part of why I like both of them so much. Uh, at that point, I will pass it off to you, Kinaret, to close us out for the day. Thanks, Isaac. And a big thank you to our speakers, to Mo and Nicole. I think this was a great presentation to mark Women's History Month and a lot of food for thought for all of us. Um, I also want to thank uh, Isaac and Eli, my partners in the coordination team for the showcase. Uh, a big thank you also to Emerald and Kevin who was here uh, for providing audio and visual support for the showcase. Um, our next showcase is on April, uh, Wednesday, April 17th, um, and we will talk about supporting multimedia content on Wikipedia. So we're looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we're no longer live on YouTube.